Hi everyone, my name is Roxana Filipowska. I'm thrilled to be here. And my talk today is A Silent Revolution, Four Things I Learned About Plastic from Researching Art. In the year 1964, the artist and educator Thelma R. Newman declared, plastics have caused a silent revolution. She meant this because the materials had become ubiquitous, and yet the average person rarely gives plastic much thought. In her book, Plastics as an Art Form, she urged artists to explore the scope of this silent revolution. She went on to publish three more volumes on this topic, and indeed many artists since the 1960s have experimented with plastics. So today I'm going to share four facets of this plastic revolution. The first is how plastics age. Advertisements usually present these materials as tough and long-lasting, but we don't usually keep them around for long enough to see how they age. Art and design objects are quite possibly the best ways to see how plastic changes over time. And recently, owners of 1960s plastic furniture have been saying that their prized possessions are exploding. In an extreme example, a styrofoam and resin bookcase began to warp because of gases forming in its interior. The owner actually drilled a hole in the bookcase in order to release some of that trapped gas, but it actually caused the resin to migrate up the walls of his living room. Plastics cause unprecedented problems for art and design. More traditional materials, such as marble and oil paint, are much longer lasting. The Mona Lisa is over 500 years young and has survived things like numerous acts of vandalism, theft, and several world wars. Not so with plastic. It ages in surprising and often unruly ways. The next thing I'd like to share is plastics and food. It is common to see plastic packaging around food. And in the 1960s, advertisers of the trade name Saran Wrap promised that polyvinyl chloride wrap would prevent contamination and messes. It would keep odors apart in the kitchen. The artist Dieter Roth also used polyvinyl chloride wrap, but to shrink wrap cultural commodities. And being a Swiss German artist, he used Swiss chocolate and German sausage. You can see a little slice of sausage right in the middle of the pink and blue papers. Today, Dieter Roth's artwork is a conservation nightmare because the plastic decays alongside with the food, oftentimes releasing toxic odors. Also, this artwork is actually prescient of things that we now know today, which is that plastics disintegrate into increasingly smaller pieces of microplastics and microfilaments that actually contaminate their environment. So theoretically, the same plastic that we use to wrap our dinner could one day wind up in the belly of a fish that could wind up as a sushi dinner. The proximity of plastic and food have infiltrated the food chain. Next, plastic and gender. Let's say I ask you to describe what you see in this Richard Hamilton painting. You may take the title as your prompt and say, Richard Hamilton depicts a pinup girl that is seductively exposing her breasts to the viewer. A closer look might lead you to notice that the figure is actually very abstract. There, is no, there are no facial features. And even though the breasts are a focal point of the painting, they're only legible as such because of what's surrounding such as the painted brassiere to the side. And if we actually saw this painting in person, then we could move to the side and see that the breasts are not painted at all. It's actually a piece of plastic that Hamilton sanded down to suggest the shape of breasts and then attached to the surface of the canvas as a breast plate. Breast plates are frequently used in drag performance. Performers, regardless of gender, can put on a breastplate to perform the role of the pinup. When you realize that the only signifier of gender within this painting is a detachable plastic breastplate, the gender of the figure no longer seems so stable. It seems ambiguous. And researching plastic does show gender as malleable. 
Bisphenol A is a synthetic organic compound found in many plastics. As it enters the human body, it becomes an endocrine disruptor because it can actually imitate the hormone of estrogen. Nowadays, it is estimated that bisphenol A can be found in 97% of the population, which means that the majority of the population contains synthetic estrogen. Focusing on plastic reveals that the gender binary is much more of a spectrum. Finally, I'd like to talk about plastic and care. In 1955, Life magazine ran an article titled Throw Away Living about single-use plastic. The article didn't promote the material of plastic as much as a type of lifestyle, one of convenience and expendability. But treating plastic as an expendable object has contributed to such issues as the accumulation of plastic in landfills and the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. When people see images like this, they, they say that the problem of plastic pollution seems overwhelming and simultaneously distant and abstract. I propose that interacting more with plastics within the context of art can allow people to interact with these materials at more intimate scales and actually inspire care. Take the work of Naum Gabo, for instance. He created the sculpture in 1926 after experiencing the Russian Revolution. At the time, he was searching for a material that was transparent and lightweight and not bogged down by the trauma and weight of history. He turned to plastic. This is what the sculpture looked like in 1926. This is what the sculpture looked like six years ago. No longer able to stand upright, it has to be bolstered up. And the situation is getting worse. I took this photo in April of last year, and it's a close-up of the base. You can see that one of its points has completely come out of the base. What was once transparent plastic now looks like a sepia filter, and the surface of the sculpture seems to be covered in beads of sweat. When I show people these images, they oftentimes say that the sculpture looks so sad, and that has, and something has to be done in order to encourage the conservation of plastic and manage plastic waste. So what's the difference between ocean plastic and plastic in the museum? Where it's a difference of value. Oftentimes, it's the same plastic that appears both in the ocean and in the museum, but it is valued differently. So what I'm proposing is that in addition to banning single-use plastic, we also have to tackle that problem of the lifestyle of throwaway living and perhaps value plastic a little bit more. So nowadays, as we're asking ourselves such questions as, does this spark joy before bringing something into our homes, we could also ask some questions of the humble plastic bottle that are inspired by art. We could, for instance, ask, how will this age? What will happen to it after I throw it away? And perhaps even more significantly, how can it transform? Thank you.